Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert. I used to be a bad guy. I mean, (laughs) there's no other way to put it. I used to be a really bad guy, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to turn it around. Podcast listeners will recognize the voice of Brett Johnson, who was previously in conversation with ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin. Brett and Steve had an interesting and informative conversation about the current landscape of cybercrime, in which Brett maintains expertise, now as a consultant, not a bad guy. I promised listeners Brett's whole story, so let's get started in today's episode, the first of a four-part conversation in which Brett details his whole life of crime and redemption. Let's jump right in. Well, it's it's been a long trip. So <laughs> where I am today, I'm I'm a consultant. I'm a public speaker, keynote speaker, I guess you would say. I keynoted over 30 conferences this year. I think it was 16 alone in, in October. Uh, travel all over the planet. Uh, I used to be a bad guy. I mean, I, 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 there's no other way to put it. I used to be a really bad guy, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to turn it around. So today I, I speak and consult and use the knowledge I gather breaking the law to help people stay safe instead of, you know, hurting people like I used to. So tell us a little bit about how you broke the law. What was your medium? My medium, cybercrime. Well, my medium, geez. <laughs> I come from uh, from eastern Kentucky, and eastern Kentucky is one of these areas like the panhandle of Florida, parts of Louisiana, where if you're not lucky enough to have a job, you might be involved in some sort of fraud. Uh, my mom was the fraudster of the family. She was like the captain of the fraud industry, in Hazard, Kentucky, that's where I'm from. No crime too big or too small. She, uh, at one time, she stole a 108,000 pound Caterpillar D9 bulldozer. Like you do. <laughs> at, another, at another time, she took a slip and fall in a convenience store and tried to sue the owner. So I grew up in that lifestyle. My first crime was 10 years old. I shoplifted food. My mom was a, a parent. She would go out and party with men all the time. She had left my dad by that point. And she'd go out and party with men, leave me and my sister alone, at, uh, you know, for days at a time. And Denise walks in. She's got a pack of pork chops with her. And I'm like, hey, where'd you get that? She was like, I stole them. I'm like, huh, show me how you did that. So she shows me how she shoplifts, and we start doing that. And then it's clothes and all this other stuff. And mom comes home finally, sees all the stuff we've stolen. Where'd that come from? Of course, I tell her we found it. She's like, no, you didn't find that. <laughs> my sister says, oh, we stole it. My mom says, huh. Show me how you did that. Mm. Joins us. So that's my first foray into crime was there. But as I got older, I got more and more involved in the types of fraud that my mom was committing and that side of the family until finally I branch off on my own, um, financed my first marriage by faking a car accident. And shortly after that, I found the Internet and took to it like a duck to water. What year was this? This would have been 94, 95. So... Um, started committing different types of internet fraud. Initially, I found uh, eBay. Had no idea how to make money on eBay until I'm watching Inside Edition one night, and Bill O'Reilly's on there talking about beanie babies. (laughs) He's talking about this one peanut royal blue elephant. So I'm like, it's going for $1,500. And I'm like, huh, I need to find me a peanut. The next day, I skip classes. I'm at UK, University of Kentucky. Skip classes, go around all the stores looking for him, can't find him because he's on eBay for $1,500. Find these little gray elephants, though, for $8. Buy one of those. Stop by the grocery store on the way home. Buy a pack of blue dye. Go home try to dye the little guy. Can't because he's made out of polyester. Get him out. It looks like he's got the mange. <laughs> but uh, that was the first crime I committed. Uh, really, I, I think that was the first crime I committed online. Um, found a picture of a real one. Posted it on eBay. A woman fell for it and uh, paid $1,500 for it. And I convinced her to send me a postal money order. She did that, and then I sent her this blue creature, and she calls complaining. And uh, I kept putting her off. And that's when I, the first lesson of cybercrime that I learned was if you keep delaying a victim long enough, a lot of them just go away, throw their hands up in the air, never complain, never hear from them again. Very few of them ever report anything to law enforcement. Um, And that was a very low, I didn't know anything about internet crime at that point. But as I continued, I got better and better. What actually ended up happening, when I was finally caught, I was charged with 39 felonies. And uh, it had to do with refining cybercrime as we know it. So if you look at any type of financial cybercrime today, from account takeovers to card not present fraud to physical counterfeit credit cards, 
any fishing, all these other things, um, the Shadow Crew and Counterfeit Library, along with another site called Carter Planet, kind of solidified all that for people. The way that happened, a Canadian judge ruled that it was legal for Canadian citizens to pirate satellite DSS signals. This would have been 97, 98. So those 18-inch satellite systems. He ruled it was legal for his citizens to pirate those signals. So overnight, what happened was, is in the United States, you could buy the system, pay $100 for it, take the card in the parking lot. You'd buy it at Best Buy. You'd get the system out in the parking lot. You'd break the system open. You'd take the, the card out of it. You'd throw the rest of the system away in the parking lot. You could program the card, sell it in Canada for $500. I started doing that, making a lot of money doing that. And I had so many orders, I couldn't fill them. So I was like, why do I need to fill any of them? They're in Canada. Hmm. Who are they going to complain to? So I didn't fill any of them, made even more money, so much that I started worrying about how much was coming in, thinking that you know, I was going to be tracked by that. So I figured, well, the best thing Brett Johnson can do is find a fake ID, set up a bank account under that, launder the money out. No idea where to get a fake ID. Not a clue. I was at university, still not a clue. So I look around on the internet, think I'll find a guy, send him $200, send him my picture, rips me off. And I get pissed. Hmm. I get really pissed. At that point, if you were looking to engage in any type of cybercrime, there really wasn't a network to do that. So what I did was is um, the only site that was that was halfway viable was a site called Counterfeit Library. It was already up and running, but they had this defunct forum at, at that point. No one was on it. So I get on there, and I just start complaining, just bitching every day about how much money this guy had stolen from me, and I'm just incensed that someone defrauded me. So <laughs> what happens is, is me and two other guys that were on the forum – and there were only probably 10 members on there at that point. Me and two other guys, we kind of networked together. One of them was called Beelzebub. He was out of Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. The other was, his nickname was Mr. X out of uh, Los Angeles. Well, come to find out, Beelzebub made fake IDs. So he makes one for me. And that's where this, this entire genesis, this, this structure of cybercrime that we're talking about today kind of comes up is uh, – he wants to sell IDs. I had no clue about how any of this stuff was made. So he had this idea. Hey, Brett, why don't you be the reviewer of every single product that comes in? By this point in time, I'm already friends with the guys who own the Counterfeit Library website. And I'm like, hey, give me the, the forum. I'll take care of it. And they're like, absolutely do whatever you want to with it. We're not using it anyway. I'm like, okay. So um, I become the reviewer. Beelzebub makes IDs. Mr. X makes social security cards, and we start setting up bank accounts and doing eBay fraud, so posting fake items on eBay, cashing out like that. What happened was, because we were the first site, it was like a field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. So that was the real first site that had any type of structure with cybercrime. If you were looking to buy personal information, credit card details, anything like that before Counterfeit Library, the only avenue you really had to do that was an IRC message channel, this kind of rolling chat session mm -hmm. We had no idea who to trust, who was who, who had a skill level, who had a product, anything else like that. Counterfeit Library solved that. So it gave that trust mechanism to criminals that hmm. they could use to network with each other, figure out skill levels, share information, everything else like that. And once we built it, people just started coming. Word of mouth came that, hey, these guys are actually providing products. So people started coming up. Um, about a year into it, Beelzebub was a marijuana grower up in Canada, so he quits and goes back to growing pot. Mr. X gets arrested in Las Vegas, cashing out at uh, casinos. So I'm the only guy left standing. I rise to the top of it. By me reviewing everything, what happened was is I got to see every single product, knew every single deal that was going on, everything else, and people relied on me to tell them who to go to. So I became top of the heap on that. Um, that ended up transitioning over to a site called Shadow Crew. In the meantime, we ended up partnering with these Ukrainians who ran a website called Carter Planet, and we became this worldwide cybercrime organization mm -hmm. that ends up making the front cover of Forbes, August of 2004, with the headline, Who's Stealing Your Identity? And October 26, 2004, the Secret Service arrests uh, 33 people, six countries in six hours. And I was the guy who got away. And they picked me up a few months later. Wow. But that's the... Uh, that's the overall arc of it. Uh, Shadow Crew and Counterfeit Library were the first organized cybercrime communities. They laid the foundation for the way modern cybercrime channels still operate today. So, yeah, big story of just nothing good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brett, lots of collaboration going on in that. We, we, we talk about, you know, on the, on the good guys side of the fence, the things that we're not very good at doing a collaboration. That story there about how you got into it, it really demonstrates that collaboration was probably the key from what you've said, right? To this day. Uh, so Script, he set up a website called 
Carter Planet. His real name is Dmitry Golubov. He's currently a member of parliament in the Ukraine. So he he opened up Carter Planet. And the reason he did that, he saw the success we were having with Counterfeit Library. And he says, hey, we've got a lot of credit information over in the Ukraine. I'm spamming all these credit card numbers. Bet we could sell these things. Let's network together. One of the big quotes that he had, he actually, they had this big meeting in Odessa, all the Ukrainian cyber criminals at the time, a conference actually. So, uh, and he gave a, an interview to a magazine called Hacker Magazine at that point. And what he said, it's true to this day. He said that a, a cyber criminal must at some point rely on someone else. You must do that. So if you're, if you're doing credit card theft, you have to be able to rely on people for credit card details if you can't get them yourself. You have to be able to rely on people for SOX 5 proxies or remote desktop protocols, drop addresses. If you're in Venezuela or Ukraine, you can't have those items shipped to you. So you have to rely on someone to reship them for you or to set up drop addresses for you or to cash out. Uh, one of the big things that the first real place that I saw it other than credit card fraud, we had this thing called the CVV1 hack. So we were fishing all this information, and we were getting the pins, getting the card numbers. In order for you to encode that information and cash out at an ATM, you have to have that the entire track two data. So the track two data, it's the card number, there's an equal sign, then there's a 16-digit algorithm out beside of that. The problem is, is you can't just guess that algorithm. You have to know it. Well, we were just fishing the card numbers and the pins. There's no way a, a consumer would know what that track two information looks like. Well, come to find out, none of the banks in the United States had implemented the hash on track two. So you could take the card number, an equal sign, and any 16 digits, mm. take it to an ATM because you already had the pin right. and cash out. The profit on that, we were stealing on just CNP, card not present fraud. We were stealing and profiting per person about thirty dollars to $40,000 a month just ordering product, fencing it through eBay or, or Craigslist or whatever yeah. the site was back then. That changed with the CVV one hack. Instead of thirty to forty thousand a month, you were looking at thirty to forty thousand a day. Right, and that's what got uh, such law enforcement attention was that that aspect of things, that amount of money being stolen all of a sudden. But it was all about uh, the problem was is for the Ukrainians, they had the the credit information, but they couldn't cash it out in the Ukraine at the time. You literally couldn't, even if you were the card owner, you couldn't run cards through the Ukraine. Everything was shut down at that point. So they, they had these massive amounts of, of credit information, these, these card numbers and things, but they couldn't profit by it. So they had to rely on other people to do that for them. We see that today. I mean, um, you go to any of these forums and marketplaces, and it's all about sharing information. Someone has an idea. Someone knows an exploit at a specific company. They network with other people. One of the big examples was this Tesco breach in November 2016. Mm -hmm. So to commit cybercrime, Three things have to happen. You have to be able to gather information, commit a crime, cash out. All three things. The problem is, is that a criminal is not good in all three things. Criminal is good in one thing. Sometimes he's good in two. No way he's going to be good at all three. So he has to rely on these other people. Tesco kind of illustrates that. So November 2016, on Alphabay, which was the largest criminal network at that point in time, on Alphabay, a brand new member comes on. He makes one post. And that post says, hey, for the past year, I've been able to steal $1,000 a week from this bank, no flags. About three weeks later, Tesco's hit for $2.5 million. Right. So what happens is, is that initial guy, that poster, he has the information. He doesn't know how to scale the crime up. He certainly doesn't know how to cash it out. But by him posting that one notice there, someone within that, that alphabet structure, which was 240,000 people at that point, someone notices the post. They say to themselves, Hey, this guy's not bragging. He's not embellishing. It looks like he's just stating a fact. Let me go talk to him. So he messages him from there. That second person knew how to commit the crime. From that point, that second person then posts a lot of basically advertisements on Alphabay. Send me your resumes. I'm looking for cashiers. He gets cashiers from the EU, the UK, Brazil, United States, $2.5 million. It's that networking, that sharing of information that turns that $1,000 a week crime into a $2.5 million crime. And that's also what makes it so difficult, right, for law enforcement, because not only have you got multiple cyber criminals working collaboratively together, but they're all around the world. Absolutely. And, and what gauges that is, so if you're crossing borders and boundaries, there's a reason for that. Either there's a geographic limit 
on the crime that you can commit there. Maybe you're getting uh, your your credit card information like the Ukrainians. They simply can't cash out at that point. Or maybe the data is specific to an area that's outside of where you're getting it. So, for example, a lot of uh, a lot of PII is stolen in the United States, but some U.S. cyber criminal may steal U.K. data. Mm-hmm. So he's not going to be able to use a lot of U.K. data here, so he's selling it over there. So you get that, that crossing of borders and boundaries. Um, for example, one of the big things right now if you're cashing out dumps, and a dump is that track two data, so right. you, you put that dump, that track two data on a, on a counterfeit credit card and you try to cash out either by ordering product or taking to an ATM machine and point cash out at that point. A lot of the dumps that are working right now in the United States are Japanese dumps. So for some reason, Japanese dumps are very good right now in the United States for buying product or taking to an ATM and cashing out. So you've still got that crossing of borders and boundaries. Where did that breach take place? It probably took place – in Japan is where they got the dump information, but you're using it in the United States. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's that crossing of jurisdictions, of borders and boundaries that creates a huge, huge issue for, for law enforcement because, I mean, the law enforcement in other countries, if you're in the Ukraine, none of those guys, as long as they stay in the Ukraine, none of those guys are going to get arrested. It's not right. going to happen. If you're, in, uh, if you're in Nigeria or Ghana, I mean, the, the Nigerian police, the cybercrime police. They're not even police. They're this advisory committee that doesn't have subpoena power, arrest power, or anything else. They simply investigate, and then they report to the actual authorities Mm -hmm. who don't do anything. So uh, people know that. When we were uh, committing crime in the United States, we were the exact same way. If we were in a city like New York, we knew the dollar amount for each specific city that actually got law enforcement attention. Mm. Right. So if it was a million dollars, you knew to stay under that bar and law enforcement wouldn't be involved. And what happened was, is of course, when you look at a group as a whole, it crosses all those, yeah. all those bars all of a sudden. We're going to leave the conversation with Brett for now, but check back soon for the second of our four-part bonus episode series in which Brett details the next stage of his criminal career. I get this knock on the door. I'm in bed, I get up. So I open up the door, step out of the hall, and there's Secret Service agents walking down the hall. They're like, Brett. I'm like, hey, guys, how are you all? I think you'll agree that that's a continuing saga you don't want to miss. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with part two of our four-part special episode series. And we'd love to hear from you. If there's someone you'd like us to speak with, or if there's a conversation topic you're interested in hearing, we'd like to know. Please get in touch with us through our website, securityforum.org, or tweet us at securityforum. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back with you soon.